start our service. If you want to visit longer, that's okay. Just take somebody out to lunch with you. Pay for it. Watch your conversation quit now. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. How many loves Jesus Christ here this morning? Amen. It's good to be back. Uh, somebody asked me if I was a pastor. I think I am. I'll ask my wife after a while. But uh, thank you for being here today. Just a lovely time to come worship Jesus Christ together. Amen. Stand with me. Let's sing this old hymn together.
Uh, just a couple of quick announcements to share. Our community Christmas baskets, again this year we are taking up corn and green beans for our community baskets. Uh, and we have to have it by next Sunday. Just 510 each. Look, I went to AGB the other day, and there's 49 cents a can. We'd be we, all right. But uh, if you can bring green beans and corn, and if you would just bring them by next Sunday, you can bring them Wednesday night, uh, and just put them in the cafe. That's where we're storing off. We get to serve about 400 families every year that's less fortunate to make sure they have a Christmas meal like everybody else. I'm thankful for the community doing this and reaching out to help other people. Amen. Amen. So if you can do that, let us know. And, and whatever we lack, I'll go Monday and let Sister Lofton buy it. <laughs> She'll use my checkbook, I'm sure. But, but if you can help us with this, we really, really appreciate it. We have to turn it in uh, on that following Tuesday. Also, our Christmas box total came in for the year. We had a goal of 300. We didn't quite make it. We had 282. But that's so much more than we had last year every year in Speedy Blogger. We might set a goal of a thousand next year. <laughs> Sister Perlin. They were full of everything. Shoes, toys, and I know our lids wouldn't close. But you'd be surprised what you can do with duct tape. That's a man's fix-all. But, but around the world, children will be receiving gifts that come from River Life Church and all that you've done. And I'm so thankful for that. Monica. Twenty-five hundred boxes from our community. <laughs> Thank God for that. Amen. And our prayer request, something else? did that last year, did we not? Two years in a row. Bring a throw or some house shoes and you really don't know the difference that it makes if somebody to show up and somebody that nobody at all to come see it and wish you a Merry Christmas and a man and a little bit. When you give, you give us unto the Lord. You can't have to give him and God will bless you. Remember this great, great cause and let's do as well. Amen. Amen. Yesterday, recovering this morning, I'll be going down after service to be with the family. 
he has got nine months of surgeries and recovery time from this accident. It's a miracle of God he's even alive. And, and so remember, Brother Marvin, when you pray, and Edie as well, for this is going to be a trying, trying time. Uh, Brother Ronnie has one more chemo treatment. He is here looking better every week. Ronnie, I love you, my brother. He's a great man of faith. He, he's spoken to my life and told me about faith and how he stands, stands upon the promises of God. You never go wrong when you stand with Jesus Christ. Ronnie, I love and appreciate you very much. Cindy? If you have a need this morning, lift your hand to the Lord. I have a good friend, Glenn Starling, as well, at heart surgery. they keeping up with his brother, remember Glenn, as well. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer this morning. David, would you stand in the back and lead us to the Lord on behalf of our needs? Father, we're so thankful for another opportunity to gather in the house this morning. Lord, I just uh, thank you for the opportunity to Amen. Ushers, if you come forward and receive a kind of offering this morning. Give, it shall be given, is what the scripture says. Good measure. Press down, shaking and running over. So let's bring to the storehouse this morning.
party. Isn't that always better when you can just have a relaxation? So it's the 30th, the Sunday the 30th at 6 p.m. here in the old church. And we're just going to come and you can come in your PJs. You can come very relaxed and comfortable. We're going to play games and just eat a bunch of junky food. And there'll be more information coming out from there. But just put it on your calendar. Sunday the 30th, 6 p.m. We hope to see you ladies there.
your face. Lord, to stand in your presence, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
to have experienced the love of Christ. Amen. You know, and um, the song I'm singing this morning, it's about 30 years old, so if you're younger than that, you probably, it's probably brand new to you. Um, it's called Jesus Built This Church on Love, and I was really just, I was trying to think of something what kind of Christmas season, and I really didn't have anything really, um, but, um, you know, what better time and season to celebrate and spread the love of Christ than the time we celebrate the great gift of our Savior, amen? And, you know, we have, we've all been so blessed to experience the love of Christ, and, you know, we need to share that with those um, maybe that haven't experienced that yet. But, you know, Suzanne, Sister Suzanne on uh, Wednesdays has kind of touched on this too. We, we can't show an example of the love of Christ out here, if outside here, if we don't first have it cultivated here in our church family and, and um, you know, share that love and, and forgiveness and um, with each other. And I read a scripture uh, recently, I'm, I, I can't remember where it was, if it was Proverbs, but it's, it said that um, love prospers when a fault is forgiven. And that just spoke so much to me because if, if you know if we can not take it upon ourselves to be the judge and jury and and just offer the forgiveness that we ourselves were forgiven you know that we were given by Christ we could probably do so much more than we do today. So anyway, I'll be quiet and I'm gonna sing the song and I think the ladies are gonna help me and if they know it. Um, and if you guys know this, just feel free to sing. <laughs> Jesus, baby. 
And I think we need to go back to Jesus building the church on love. Hello, everybody. Thank you. 
the world as it has lessened God's word. And the scripture tells us that he's a God that changes not. But yet in order to fit to make us comfortable we try to change this book. Let me tell you change in the book is not your answer. Because you're going to be judged by the book, so you better get it straight from the Word of God. Now, somebody asked me, said, Pastor, you you look sick. Well, thank you very much. They said, are you losing weight on purpose? Yes, I am. Uh, I want to be medicine free. That's what I want for myself. And, and I'm the only one that can make that happen. So I, I'm, somebody said, you don't have cancer, do you? <laughs> Boy, your minds are bad. <laughs> when a man just pushes back from the pecan pies and the coconut pies, I said, oh, God, help me. Uh, all of that stuff. And, you, and, you, and they, I had three or four to ask me this morning, are you sick? No, I'm, I'm not sick. I feel good. I'm glad to be home. Amen. Now, Carl and Melanie and the kids are having a little uh, vacation time at the ranch. And, and Carl, if you're looking, stay off my deer stands. That's all I'm going to say. But today, I want to take you to God's Word in Luke chapter 6. Do you feel like that maybe you are blinded? That you have a blindfold on and you really don't see. Have you ever had a conversation with your children and it would be something like this? You really don't see. You really don't understand. You ever tell your kids that? Uh, you're not looking at the big picture. And it's like they walk through life with a blindfold. And they do not see well, I'm afraid the body of Christ has blindfolded itself that we're not seeing the perilous times that was prophesied that is coming. And so we've got to have clear vision. Now, sometimes in the morning when I get up, I don't have clear vision. Do you? The other night we were at the hospital. We had to go down to Conroe and we watched uh, Chelsea. We were coming back in that rain. And if you've been on 45, I don't know who the engineer is, but God bless your soul. <laughs> and, and it's raining and you can't see the stripes. And I, I told Sue, I cut off quick. Travis, I just cut off. And she said, this is not a turnoff. I said, oops. <laughs> I didn't have clear vision. I said, I can't see. He said, do you want me to drive? And I said, no way. <laughs> now I'll leave that story for another time. But anyway, uh, it, it's like that we have to be reminded constantly. But one thing you better not ever change in your life, you better look unto Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of your faith. He's the only one that's going to get us out of all of this mess. Amen. Amen. 
So we got to have clear vision. Now, notice with me the scriptures in Luke 6, beginning in verse 39. And he spoke a parable to them. Now, you've got to understand a parable is like a story. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus used a lot of parables to get his teaching across. Now, a parable falls, falls into one of three categories. Number one, just a, a general topic. Number two is pertaining to the church age. Or number three is relating to the messianic kingdom of God. That Jesus is kingdom upon the earth. Now, this is a general, but it's also talking about the church age. If you'll notice what it says. And he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, now this is talking church. I don't, you, don't, you don't go uptown to the cafe or go to the mall over in Huntsville and everyone you say, brother. He's talking to church folk. He's talking to us. Brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye. Now, I like what he said. Hypocrite! First, remove the plank from your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them. Now notice there's some requirements. They come to him, they hear him, and they do what he said. I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Clear vision. I like how he opens up and just says, can the blind lead the blind? I don't know about you, but when it's pitch black, no moon, and you ever hear those saying you can't see your hand in front of you? Now, folks, that's dark. And I don't know about you, but the older I get, I trip more. Anybody like that? And if I don't know where to put my foot, I stagger. And if I am in the dark, I don't want anybody in the dark with me saying, take my hand, brother, and I'm going to lead you right out of this mess. Because I perceive in my mind that he's as blind as I am. He cannot see. It. So therefore, why do we join hands with people who cannot help us? Why do we have association with people 
that really do not see. Because, as Brother Jerry, it says, if the blind lead the blind, we're both going to fall in the ditch. I don't want to wind up in a ditch. I want somebody that has clear vision. Now let's talk about some things this morning. Number one, about darkened vision. These are the people that are blinded by their own spiritual ignorance. They think they know everything, but yet they know nothing. They know enough of this to make them dangerous. And they only will reach in here and glean what they want to hear. But when it comes to chastisement or correction, they don't want that part at all. Well, I want to tell you what. If you don't want to raise a small brat, you better be constant in your correction. And I've got news for you. Small brats ain't going to heaven. So, just grab that. We're either going to love him or we don't love him. He makes it very simple in the scripture that we're for him or we're against him. We're either walking with him or we're walking away from him. He puts this thing in such a way that everybody can simply understand. But when you have darkened vision, you are blinded and you become hypocritical. Now, how in the world can I tell you, Dale, let me get that little old bitty speck that's in the corner here. It's been aggravating me to death, and I'm walking around with a tube of six in mine. Amen. Now, did it say a plank? A plank is not something little, but we get so accustomed to being blind that we think we're right. And we get darkened about our convictions with God, Brother Nick, but yet we can say, hey, hey, Dale, let me get the speck out of your eye. First, I'm going to have to find your eye. And you're going to let a blind person reach in and help you. I think not. I don't want you reaching in my eye with tweezers. I do not want you around my head when you cannot see. But yet we've got a lot of people walking in this world that's taking spiritual advice from blind people. Amen. And you're going to wind up in the ditch. That's what the scripture says. Darkened vision is something that we have to address. Notice with me Matthew 15, 13, 14. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. They're going to be found out. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. Look at chapter 23, verse 24. Blind guides who sprang out a net. But they swallow a camel. Now, have you ever had a little bug to fly in your mouth? It feels that big around. And you'll sit there and you'll, and, and, and you'll just make all kind of sound because you're choking to death off of something so small. But yet, we'll get all bent up out of something real, real small, and yet we'll open up our mouth and swallow something so large that is not correct, and we won't even have any trouble swallowing it. Right. You are blinded. If we are so against just a little small thing, Brother Gail, but yet we allow greater things to come in and we have no problem in difficulty, we have become darkened or blind in the spiritual things of God. Notice Romans 2 and 19. I got you a lot of scripture today. And are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind. A light to those who are in darkness. Now, you got I don't have time to get above it or beneath it, but it's talking about hypocrites. A lot of people think that you can help a lot of people when you can't help yourself. Boy, it's going to be quiet. I knew it. Doc, you better pray for me. <laughs> There's a lot of people that think you're a spiritual guru and you don't know the scripture correctly to really help somebody else. 
Now, there is a limit that you can help anybody. Brother and sister, you can help one another and do this. But be careful of all the spiritual advice you give if it's not backed up by God's Word. Because it better be Word-based. It better be backed by the Word of God or we're going to be guilty of everything we try to convince people of. Can I have an amen? amen. I thought I'm going to get you back up here. They, they're watching me. Blind people can't see themselves. You only talk what somebody tells you that you look like. If I'm blind and I cannot see, and Russell tells me, you're the ugliest human I've ever seen in my life. You have a kind face, Pastor, the kind nobody wants. <laughs> But then I have Sister Ruth that comes up and says, you're the most handsome rascal I've ever seen in my life. Now, I've got to make my decision which one I'm going to believe. I believe Ruth is telling the truth. <laughs> you're a lying rascal. <laughs> but blind people cannot see themselves. And they really can't see themselves in spiritual matters. Yeah. Yeah. To them, they're perfect. And they become a little immune from conviction. And so they throw out all kind of spiritual advice when they themselves cannot see what they really are. I want to tell you something. We have a 24-hour a day job to get ourselves to heaven. But before you go and then trying to pull somebody the way that you really know inside of yourself is wrong, you need to hush your mouth and get back before God and get yourself straight with God before you get it back. The darkening, the vision is not correct. Jeremiah 5.21 says, Hear this now, O foolish people, without understanding. I don't think, Brother Gail, that people understand the consequence. Amen. Isn't it over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, and we all stand before the judgment seat of God and give an account of what we've done in this body, whether it be good or whether it be bad? I want to tell you what, there is coming a judgment, and we really got to be careful. Amen. Right. Now, who have eyes... And see not. They have ears. And they hear not. We have got to be so in tune that we need to hear when God speaks to us. Amen. But a lot of us have eyes that we cannot see and ears that we do not hear. And these people are darkened in their vision. Now I, I, I said and place something else here. A scripture. I said non-spiritual people. Needs to quit giving spiritual advice. I'm not going to go down to somebody and let them shuffle a few cards out and go. I don't believe in that giant. That's witchcraft. I have no part of witchcraft. I don't know. I don't need you to read a tarot card about me. I've read the back of the book. And I know where I stand. And I know where I'm going. Amen. And I know that I might have to suffer a little persecution and go through some things, but I know the end result where I'm going to end up at. I don't need somebody that don't know God, has never felt God, and never knows about God trying to give me some spiritual advice. What I need to change in my life. I need a Holy Ghost filled seasoned veteran of the cross to come and tell me that, hey, you might want to try this. That is the advice that I think I will take. Amen. Thank you, Brother David. God. David Morrison's behind me this morning. Now, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this. You got that, Sister Kevin? But you are a chosen generation. You need to quit letting the devil tell you you're a little nobody from nowhere. Listen to what the scripture said. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are part of the family of God. You are somebody. But he has called us out of darkened places right into his light. Anybody hear me this morning? Amen. So quit running back to the dark. Stay in the light. 
I had somebody who says, Pastor, I meditate in the graveyards. I like to go at night and walk among the graves. Before I spoke anything, I thought to myself, idiot. <laughs> I'm pastor, there's nobody there can get you. I know that. <laughs> but I'm still not going to walk around in the graveyard. That's not my hangout. I'm closer to God. And I thought to myself, I'm getting mugged. <laughs> there are just some places you don't go and hang out. I want to walk where the light is. Why? Because I don't stumble. I don't fall. I know exactly. I've got clear direction. I've got a clear path. I can see without any dark vision. And so therefore, the blind is not going to lose or lead me. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now let's talk about false vision. My brother showed me a... Now, I know this deer season, and I'm going to use this... Brother Jimmy Cochran understand. He has a game camera. It takes pictures of what comes to the feeder. He said, you're not going to believe what comes to my feeder. I said, here we go. He's signing Bigfoot. <laughs> I'm not going to believe what he has. <clears throat> he said, I got a deer this morning. I thought to myself, it would be easy to kill. <laughs> but it comes up there, and really all that's left of these deer, his eyes, is one little speck that he can see of. I said, how do you know that he cannot? He said, everything is dark, and I caught him in the daylight. His eyes are just white and over. And he said, but that one has a And he knows where to go and where to come. He said, he hardly has any vision. There's a lot of people that you have vision, but you have a false vision. Let me explain to you. Now, notice what the scripture says. How can I get the speck out of your eye when I'm so messed up myself? I can't. Because my vision is dark. But then it comes up on this next portion of scripture. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit. Nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns. Nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. But a good man out of the treasure of his heart brings forth good and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speak. Do we really take a look at ourselves? This morning, I was shaving and I was making sure I didn't miss any spots. And you make faces when you shave, guys. Go and get, make sure all the hairs are gone and and I'm checking and I'm looking because my eyebrows are like two caterpillars a lot of times. <laughs> and, and they said I have a unibrow, so I, I got those tweezers. And man, you women go through a lot of pain to be pretty. But I plucked them and I said, well, that's as good as it gets. <laughs> Kenny, I looked and I got that hair just right. Boy, and I had that baby comb back and I looked good. And I, I looked myself and I walked back and I walked back to that mirror and went, <laughs> I like Fonzie. Hey. <laughs> when I got this small suit on I had four years, I come out and I was styling and profiling. Amen. I, I was so in my life, I said, oh, you look good. And I, I nearly blacked out. <laughs> I ain't had a compliment like that in a long time. And Chelsea gave me one. Oh, you look good. Blue is my color. Matches mine. <laughs> but we forget really what we look like. We have false vision. This is not pretty. <laughs> a lot of people have a misconception of what you really like. Yeah. We go.
go to that mirror and we look and we notice what wasn't there two weeks ago. We noticed the, the old lines and, and all of that. I said a picture of me and some of my friends out of my graduating class of 32 was five preachers come out of that little class. And we were sitting there, and Bruce and Scott and myself and Bob was here, and we were missing one more. Ronnie wasn't there, but we were all sitting there, and I looked and I said, golly, and John Ampers, I don't need you to open your mouth. I know what's running in your devious mind right now. And I said, golly, I had blonde hair back in high school. And I did. And I looked at those guys and I looked at myself and I said, pretty good looking group. Until I went to my class reunion, my 35 year class reunion. I had to go back outside and make sure I was at the right center. <laughs> Them guys look like 40 miles of bad road, bad. <laughs> so me being shy and timid, I got up and I told them, I'm the prettiest one here by far. Life hasn't been good to y'all at all. At all. And one is still stone from the 70s, ain't it? <laughs> still stone, cut stone. So then we look at what we used to be. And we go to the mirror now and look, and we have false vision. It's not blonde hair anymore. It's not any of that. Things change, but people refuse to take a look at how we really are. But until you take a look at how you are, you'll never come to the place that God has for you. Amen. It's got to be truth. It's got to be reality. So do we take a look at ourselves? Or what kind of fruit are we producing? Are we a good tree or a bad tree? Are we bearing fruit or we don't bear fruit? That is the gauge. You see, there's no turning good on and off to just fit you. You are what you are. You're either a good person or a bad person. Over the years, it Brother Jack, it really got me and it graded me when people in the church would say, I'll lay down my sanctification and I'll go tell them all and I'll curse them and I'll do everything and come back and pick it up. That is a false vision, honey. You're either with him or you're not with him. You're either loving him or you don't love him. But you don't lay down your salvation. You don't lay down your sanctification just when it's convenient for you. You're either good or you're bad. Anybody hear me? We have false vision. James 3, 10 and 12. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Don't you leave church and go down to Brookshire, brothers, and because some buggy accidentally bumps in your car, get out and curse him for everything he's worth, and then jump in your car and go, Hallelujah. Doesn't work that way. Can't flow out blessings and cursings out of the same fountains. Shall not be. Verse 12. Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives? Or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Now, in my backyard is a mimic fig tree. <laughs> it is. It's pitiful. Got them about that tall this year, and this is the most beautiful green leaves you ever seen. Boy, I thought some miracle growing by. And I said, This is going to be the year I will get things. One appeared all year long. <laughs> One. And before I could get out there, bird got it. But I knew it was a fig tree when I planted it. So I expected figs. On the other side of the yard, I have a Myers lemon 
bush. It ain't a tree. The tree died and the sprigs took off. And, and I, that little thing just become loaded. I said, my higher's limit, you ain't had one old. You're missing out. They get about that big around. They're mad and sweet. Oh, they're awesome. But mine didn't get that big around. Mine got that big around. <laughs> And, and so Sister Lofton was out of limb and she said, I wonder if we could uh, get one of them happy. I said, be right back. Rick, I ran out in the backyard and I was so excited. I picked three or four of them back and I realized they were hard. But I brought them back and we cut them open and I'm going to tell you what, you could have got a vice and cranked on it and might have got a... <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Some of your fruit. <laughs> you think you're full. No, you got, that's it. <laughs> you have false vision. Now don't get mad at me and leave. <laughs> People of false vision that's bearing bad fruit give faulty instruction. Proverbs 15, 2 and 28 says this. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pour forth foolishness. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. So be careful who you take instruction from. Anybody hear me? Chapter 18, verse 21 of Proverbs says this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. What does it say? You need to be careful. If somebody starts off spiritual instruction like this to you, bless God, I'd tell them off. Walk away. They're just going to give you faulty instruction. They're going to give you instruction of the flesh. But the spirit man will be the one that says, the word says Amen. to love your enemies. The word says pray for those that despitefully use you. The word says now you're getting correct instruction. But a lot of people have false vision. When I say that they have false, give faulty instruction, then they become deceivers. I never want to deceive anybody. But that's why I give you this. Because my opinion is not what matters. Because my opinions might not be right. But Janie, God's word is always correct. But now, when they become deceivers, look at 2 Timothy 3 and 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. James 1, 22 through 25. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. I want to tell you what, when you see yourself as you really are, now you're beginning to have correct vision that I have got to follow the instruction of God's Word. Amen? Amen. Last but not least, what about proven vision? But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my saying and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug the... Can I get verse 48 up there, please? Chapter 6 of Luke. I, you've got to see some of these things. It's early. Nobody panic. Who dug deep and laid the foundation... On the rock. Amen. Now the rock. 
is Jesus Christ. But a lot of people, if you're having trouble staying in God and with God, you haven't dug deep enough yet. We got a lot of people that scratched a little bit of the ground and you think that you're founded and you're rooted and you're built up. But honey, until you claw all of the dirt and all of the debris away and until you find rock, you're not going to be on the foundation that you need. So what you got to do, you got to keep digging and digging and digging. And then when you put your foot on the solid rock, now you have a foundation that will sustain you in this day that we live. You got to dig deep. Why? Because the floods are coming. They're going to beat against the house. But they cannot shake it because it's founded on the rock. When you give me a born again child of God with a true relationship with Jesus Christ, they can face anything that the devil throws their way. Why? Because you can beat against them. You can do anything. But honey, something is holding them to the ground. And that is the rock of Jesus Christ that is their foundation. Can somebody say hallelujah? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You can build on anything you want to, honey, but as far as me and my house, we're going to build upon the rock of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we'll be able to weather and face anything that comes our way. Somebody say hallelujah in this house. What about the other camp? Building on false things. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man, Angela come, who built a house on the earth without a foundation. We got a lot of people, you don't have no foundation. You built your things on money. You built your things on possessions. You built your faith in your life on what you can do. But you're going to die. You know one thing I've never seen? I have preached thousands of funerals over these 40 years. I've never seen a U-Haul behind the hearse. Never have. I've seen things put in casket, but I've never seen, well, reminded me of the story of a Older gentleman had married a real pretty young woman. He's dying. In Dallas, she comes to the bedside and his last request was, would you give me all the money that I have? She said, I will. Funeral came and she walked up with the best friend and gently she took something out of her hand and placed it in his. She said, what are you doing? She said, I gave him all his money. I wrote a check, and if that sucker can cash it, he can have it. <laughs> you can't take things with you, folks. It said that the storm coming, the floods came and beat against the house with no foundation, and the grade of that house was great. When your money runs out, you're still in dilemma. When your possessions has faded away, you have nothing. But if you have Jesus, you have it all. To make your life successful, you need to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. You can have all the learning that you can get. That's not enough. You can have all the health till you live to be 120. That's not enough. The fact is we have an eternity that we got to face. And David, the only thing that matters is how deep we've dug. Jenny, how deep have we dug that we feel the rock? Jesus even told Peter when he says, Who do men say that I am? 
Some said you're Elijah. Some said you're Moses or one of the other prophets. He said, but who do you say that I am? And Hayden, he said, Peter's talking to Christ. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, Peter, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So now, if Jesus is saying, if you built on the rock, and I'm the rock, let whatever come your way, but you still will be standing. I'm here to tell somebody today, make sure your foundation is sure. Make sure you have a proven vision. So what have you built your life on? Would you bow your heads with me today? Savior, I come to you in the lovely name of Jesus. I pray for clear vision for this church. I pray for clear vision for all that is here. I pray that you would stir our hearts today in our lives to let us dig down deep till we find the rock. I ask you today that you touch every man, woman, boy, and girl, and if they're struggling in any area of their life, that today, God, you draw them to you. And so right now, Holy Spirit, just go forth. Move upon every heart, every life, and do your work, your will. So while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you're here today and you want to make sure that you're founded on the rock. I invite you to come this morning. If you've been struggling in areas and having difficulty, if you need to dig to the rock, I ask you to come this morning. If all is here that you are on the rock, I commend you. But if you've been battling and you've been swayed and you've been knocked down, Come to the rock this morning. The rock of Jesus Christ. No one is going to fault you. No one is going to look at you and go, there's nothing to them. No, this is about you and Christ today. This is you and Jesus today. This is about getting things right with Him today. To give you strength to face the storm. To give you strength to find that place in Him. Anyone else? All the workers, I need you to come. I need your, I need your help. As we pray for these, and just bear with us for a moment.